He cast back his cloak, flashed out his sword, and the silver and sable of Gondor gleamed on him as he rode forward. I am a messenger of the king, he said. You are speaking to the king's friend, and one of the most renowned in all the lands of the west. You are a ruffian and a fool. Down on your knees in the road and ask pardon, or I will set this troll's bane in you. The sword glinted in the westering sun. Merry and Sam drew their swords also and rode up to support Pippin, but Frodo did not move. The ruffians gave back. Scaring Breland peasants and bullying bewildered hobbits had been their work. Fearless hobbits with bright swords and grim faces were a great surprise. And there was a note in the voices of these newcomers that they had not heard before. It chilled them with fear. Greetings and well met, my friends. Yoiston here, and I hope you all are doing well, wherever you are in Middle-earth. Today we will be speaking about what happened during the scouring of the Shire, Sauron's takeover of the Land of the Hobbits. We will also explore how our four Hobbit heroes returned and freed their homeland. Please check out the related videos and articles linked in the description and cards above for more information and for some of the sources of today's video. My friends, thank you all for joining me today. Let us begin our tale. Shortly after the Hobbits, Frodo, Sam, Merry, and Pippin left the Shire in the late part of 3018 of the Third Age, things began to go astray in the land that was once so peaceful and full of good folk. Lotho and Lobelia Sackville Baggins had bought and taken up residence in Bag End, the former home of Bilbo and Frodo Baggins. From there, Lotho, the son of Lobelia and the late Otho, started to buy up much of the property in the Shire, as well as the goods and foods from such properties. Lotho then gave many of the properties and supplies to men from the south. Ruffians and brigands were they, and they were from Isengard. Many of the supplies went south to Nan Kurunir, Saruman's Vale, and that is how Saruman had pipeweed that Merry and Pippin found after the drowning of Isengard during the War of the Ring. After a time, there were shortages of food, pipeweed, and beer in the Shire, at least for the hobbits, but not for the men who now dwelt there. Men settled here and there in the Shire, and uprooted, dug, and built where they would. At first, Lotho paid for the goods and damages, but the men soon began to take what they wanted. The land became industrialized, as Sandyman's mill was knocked down and men came and built a worse mill, full of outlandish contraptions which polluted the air and water. Eventually, Will Whitfoot, the mayor of the Shire, rose up in protest against Lotho and his deeds, but the ruffians captured him and put him in the lock holes, which were storage tunnels turned prison cells in Mickle Delving. After this, Lotho called himself the Chief Sheriff, or simply the Chief, as the Sheriffs were some of the greatest hobbit protectors and militants of the land. The hobbits called him Pimple and Insult. Early in the year 3019, unknown to the hobbits, their quiet and secretive guardians, the Dúnedain Rangers of the North, who had protected many of their borders, went south as the Grey Company, to the aid of their chieftain Aragorn, known in the north as Strider. This allowed even easier entry for the brigands into the Shire. Lotho continued to rule as the chief of the Shire, making things only worse. The party tree was cut down, and Bag shot Row, the row of holes that contained the home of Gaffer and Sam Gamgee, was made a sand and gravel quarry. It was worse even than Sam's vision in the Mirror of Galadriel could have told. Ted Sandyman and some other hobbits had become the allies of the chief and eventually Sharky, who in the waning of the year 3019 came north into the Shire. He entered the Shire on September 22nd, and ended Lotho's reign, and sent Lobelia to the Lockholes. The Shire was truly corrupted and in a terrible state, and it saddens me to think what would have happened if our brave four hobbits had not returned out of the south. But indeed, on August 28th, even as the hobbits, Gandalf, and some of the elves went north from Isengard, they encountered Saruman and his servant, Grima Wormtongue, on the road. They let the two go after a brief conversation, just as Treebeard had let them loose from Isengard, for they did not seem to impose any immediate threat. But Saruman spoke of the South Farthing and its state, to the worry of Sam, who wished that they would hurry home. But even after Celeborn and Galadriel and their company departed from the Hobbits, Gandalf, Elrond, and the others who came north, the latter group went to Rivendell and saw Bilbo. Eventually, in late October, they came into Bree and realized much had changed for the worse. After this, the four hobbits made for home, and Gandalf went to visit Tom Bombadil, the moss gatherer. But before he departed from them, Gandalf reminded the hobbits of Saruman's invested interest in the Shire. 
On October 30th, the hobbits reached the Brandywine Bridge to find it gated off. The gatekeeper, Hob Hayward, eventually recognized Mary and told them that they could not enter and the gate was closed from sundown to sunrise. Mary and Pippin climbed the gate, and a horn sounded, alerting a nearby man of the gate breaking, and Bill Fernie came forth. He caught the glint of steel and heard the threat of Mary Brandybuck, so he unlocked the gate. He would throw the key at Mary and run off, getting kicked by Bill, the legendary pony in the process. Hob continued to catch the hobbits up on the events of the last year, and they took lodging in a hobbit guardhouse nearby, adding more and more offenses against the newly imposed and unjust rules of Sharky's men. The next day, they went on to Frogmorton, where they would be nearly arrested by sheriffs, accusing the four of breaking many rules and laws. But Sam added more to the list, and the hobbits just laughed them off. One of the sheriffs was Robin Smallborough, and Sam gave him harsh words, but Robin gave Sam insight into how even the sheriffs were being treated terribly by the evil men. The four went on towards Bywater, and the country of Frodo and Sam, to find sadness there as well. Then they encountered other men, but they answered to Sharky directly, not to the chief. They threatened Frodo, but ran off when the other three hobbits drew their weapons and gleamed with valor in the sun. They, as were all the ruffians in the Shire, were used to bullying small and simple hobbits who cared for simple pleasures. They knew not their peril at the hands of these four heroes who had saved the world, wore the raiment of the grandest kingdoms of men yet on earth and who yet held friendship with beings from the Elder Days. Besides all of this, Pippin and Merry were also larger than other hobbits because of the Entdraft. The brigands ran off, and Sam rode to find Tom Cotton, the oldest farmer of that region. Behind him sounded the horn call of Buckland, as Merry roused many hobbits. In this moment, Merry had used a horn given to him by Eowyn that had come from the horde of Scatha the Dragon, and had been made by the dwarves long ago. These moments speak to how much the hobbits had grown, showing that they were not scared of some bullies from the south, for they had seen true evil, and they had defeated it. The awakening of the Shire had finally begun. Sam caught up with Farmer Cotton on the road, and spoke to him of his family. And Sam went on to the house and spoke with Mrs. Cotton, Rosie, and their family who had remained there. Rosie Cotton was safe, and Sam was glad. Eventually, Sam went back and journeyed on to Bywater, and found his friend speaking with Farmer Cotton, and there were other hobbits there who had weapons. The hobbits had made a great fire, even against the laws of the brigands. The sheriffs came up the road, and after seeing this, took off their feathers and joined the other hobbits. Cotton told the hobbits of the resilience of the Tooks in their land, for they were good shooters of bows, and had deep holes, and the great smiles and all. They had shot a few of the brigands, since then, the brigands had kept a close watch on Tookland. Pippin was glad, for he himself was a Took, and eventually he went off to rally his folk, as he wanted to bring forth an army of his kin by morning. Some ruffians came up the road that night where the hobbits were gathered, and these were the same men Pippin and the others had scared off before. They found that they were surrounded, but they would not be frightened off again, as there were twenty of them. Even as the man moved to strike Mary, he was shot dead with arrows, and then the others gave up. After the short conflict, Frodo and Sam went to Cotton's house, while Merry set up lookouts around the town. Cotton explained how Lotho had bought up a lot of the Shire and took over, but has since been replaced by Sharky, as we have previously discussed, and Sam found his father the gaffer, and brought him into the home. In the morning, a messenger came speaking of Pippin's success, as many hobbits were on their way, but Merry, who had been scouting, said nearly 100 brigands were four miles away, as they had come from Waymeet. A hundred strong hobbits came with Pippin, and the brigands arrived in a trap that the hobbits set. Thus, the Battle of Bywater took place, and Merry slew a great brigand chieftain, who was alike to an orc. After this, hobbit archers surrounded the rest who surrendered. Nearly seventy men had been slain, and nineteen hobbits were as well, while thirty others were wounded. This battle would be remembered by the hobbits evermore. The four hobbits would lead on to the hill soon after, to deal with the leader of the brigands once and for all. Then they experienced one of the saddest hours of their lives, seeing how everything had been perverted. Sam and Ted Sandyman argued for a time, and Merry blew his silver horn of Rohan and Hobbiton, rousing up more hobbits. There, at Bag End, they found some of the most sorrowful sights of their lives, as that home had been made terrible and sick. 
It stank, and the greenery was dead. It was one of the cruelest strokes of Mordor and its works. Then Sharky came forth, and Frodo found that he was Saruman. It gave the fallen wizard great pleasure to have hurt the hobbits so, and he announced a curse upon the Shire and the very ground where his blood would be spilt if he was harmed by a hobbit. But Frodo had given into mercy, for even during the Battle of Bywater he drew not his sword, and ensured proper mercy be given by the hobbits. He proclaimed that none should harm Saruman, even though he believed that the wizard had not the powers to curse, only the powers to persuade. He said that the wizard should go. Saruman called to his worm Grima, and then they went on their way. But as Saruman passed Frodo, he drew a knife and stabbed at the hobbit. The mithril armor of the hobbit lord caught the knife and broke it. But Sam and many other hobbits threw Saruman to the ground, and Sam drew his sword. Even so, Frodo wished that none should still hurt Saruman, for he himself had not been injured. Saruman looked at Frodo with respect and hatred, before foretelling that Frodo should not live a long or healthy life. Saruman went to leave, and once again called Wormtongue to him. But to Grima, Frodo offered another choice, and said that he need not follow him, as Frodo knew of no evil Grima had done to the hobbits, even offering the man aid. Then Saruman told of how Grima had murdered Lotho, the chief, in his sleep. And even though Saruman had commanded Grima to bury the hobbit, the man had been so hungry, so it's possible that Grima disposed of the body in a different way. Saruman continued to insult Wormtongue and kicked him in the face. That was it. The man grabbed a hidden knife and sliced Saruman's throat. He ran down the lane and was shot dead by the arrows of the hobbits before Frodo could stop them. A grey mist rose up from the disheveled corpse of Saruman, and it dissipated in the wind. The scouring of the Shire was now over. The Hobbit heroes were now tasked with cleaning and healing the Shire. Fredegar Bolger and Mayor Whitfoot were freed, but the Mayor was unfit for his duty. So Frodo in the meantime served as the Deputy Mayor. Lobelia was also freed, and she gave Bag End back to Frodo. She soon passed away, and she left the remainder of her money to help hobbits that were left homeless by Saruman and her son Lotho. But I would argue that the chief healer of the Shire was Sam, for he planted a Malorn tree in the party fields, since the party tree had been cut down, and he used the soil given to him by Lady Galadriel to regrow much of the Shire. The healing process would go on, even into the Fourth Age. The year 3021 of the Third Age was considered to be the most prosperous and productive year in the Shire's history. In the year 6 of the Fourth Age, King Elisar announced the Shire was a free and protected land in the reunited kingdom, and he forbade any full-size man from entering that land. In 31, he expanded the border of the Shire westward from the Far Downs to the Tower Hills as Westmarch. Even after Frodo left these hither shores, Sam, Merry, and Pippin continued to serve and rebuild the Shire as Mayor of Mickledelving, Master of Buckland, and Thane of Tukland, respectively and the Shire became whole once again. Thus we come to the end of our tale about the Scouring of the Shire. From what happened during the Scouring of the Shire, we see how anyone, no matter who they are or what they've been through, has a spark of courage and will within them that must be kindled. Let not bullies or those with fell intentions destroy that which is fair, for we have the courage to protect such things in this world, and together we may rebuild the world to share in peace. Thank you all so much for watching, I really hope you all enjoyed today's video. If you did, please be sure to hit that like button and share this with a friend. What are your thoughts, questions, additions, and corrections about the Scouring of the Shire? Let me know in the comments below. For me, the Scouring of the Shire is such a sad event in the Legendarium, for it shows the downfall of such a wonderful place, but it is also inspiring as it depicts the strength of the gentlefolk and what it takes to defend one's home, people, and future. It shows us the courage of the hobbits. Please check out our music channel, Facebook, Twitter, Merch, and Patreon for a podcast and Discord server. Links are in the description below. I also wanted to give a shout out to our friends over at the History of Middle Earth channel. They are a quickly growing and great Tolkien channel, and I hope you guys check them out. Also check out the rest of our friends in the Great Alliance section of our channel. They are all quite amazing. Also a huge thanks to our Valar tier patrons, Adrian De La Tour, Peter Shepard, Chris Ortner, Kyle Wetzel. Thank you guys so much, it means the world to me. Finally, don't forget to subscribe and hit that bell button to join the Men of the West and all of the Free Peoples today, and I'll see you all again next week with a new Timeline of Arda video speaking about the Ruin of Doriath.
As always, thank you all so much for joining me on this adventure. Until the next one, my great friends.